So I did a whole video about the multi-tool, which I truly believe is one of the most important saws a remodeler can own. And yes, I refer to it as a saw because I think its ability to cut wood and other materials is by far its most important function. In fact, its ability to make fine plunge cuts in place is what makes it totally unique in the world of tools. I touched briefly in that first video on how to actually make cuts with the multi-tool, but I didn't go into a lot of detail and a lot of people have asked me since to elaborate on how I make straight clean cuts with mine. So that's what I'm talking about today. And keep in mind that I'll link various tools and bits seen in this video down in the description. And I'll also link my new kids books, the Dungeon World series. This is something else I do, believe it or not. And the books are available on Amazon as well. So if you want to support the channel, feel free to check out all those links below. With that said, let's get on with the video. When discussing how to effectively use a tool, I sometimes think it's best to discuss how not to use it because by focusing on mistakes, you kind of naturally lead into tips on proper usage. So that's how I'm gonna frame this discussion. But first, I'll say that the biggest issue with the multi-tool is that it's a straight line tool. It's kind of like a flashlight with a tubular handle that's also the motor housing and the blade pointing straight out of the end. This makes it kind of awkward to hold. It won't sit itself on the cut surface like a circular saw or a jigsaw because it doesn't have a sole plate. So you have to carry the weight while you're cutting and the tool is free to swing and pivot in three dimensions, which complicates things. On top of that, it vibrates pretty heavily. This can cause grip issues, especially when you're using fine finger control and it can like lull your hand to sleep if you're using it for a long time. So cutting effectively with a multi-tool can be tricky, but there is a system to it and it really comes down to avoiding a handful of things. With that said, mistake number one is failure to brace your cutting position. As I said, the tool isn't grounded, it doesn't sit on anything, but you still want to cut directly into material perpendicular to the surface and draw the tool in straight lines. You won't be able to do this if you don't brace or ground your cutting position. By this, I mean that you have to anchor your hands or arms or some part of your body against a solid surface because doing so will produce stability. This is a lot like gun handling where shooters take sturdy positions to create bone to bone or bone to ground body structures to eliminate movement. They're essentially welding the rest of the body in place so they can isolate fine control down to just their arms and hands. Using the multi-tool is very similar. When I'm cutting, especially at the start, I wanna plant some part of my hands against a stable surface, usually below my cut line. I often do this with my knuckles or my wrist or even sometimes just a pinky or elbow. And this is also why you always wanna cut with two hands on the tool. Other than for simple safety concerns, this also lets you create more subtle, complex hand positions. One hand stabilizes the tool, the other hand helps carry the motor weight and guide the movement. You can really create any hand structure you need and your mind kind of figures out what is required. By doing this, you're also taking out some of your jolting random muscle movement. You're grounding your body to something more stable than you. And I'm not saying you can't use it totally freehand, some people do, but I think it's really helpful to brace your position, especially at first when lineup is most important. And on the topic of starting a cut, mistake number two, is failure to score a cut line. When I see newcomers cut with a multi-tool, the first thing I see them do wrong is pick a part of the cut and just start plunging away. They immediately begin gouging for depth, but this is a bad idea. I think in the vast majority of cases, you wanna start by scoring a cut line. To do this, you wanna first use a square or straight edge to mark your cut path. Oftentimes, this will be in place on a door jam or wall because those are the sort of interruptive cuts we're making in remodels. But with this visual guide in place, I like to then use the moving saw blade to score or etch a shallow curve all the way across my cut line. This is really important for a couple of reasons. One, it severs the top layers of wood, which are most likely to split or fray with aggressive cutting. I sometimes even score my cut line with a utility knife in advance to start this severing process because this produces cleaner cuts really for all saw blades. But two, etching a whole cut line gives an advanced groove for the tool to follow as you begin digging into the wood with more pressure. The first contact is the most important. You want to sight down the blade and gently press it to the surface, perfectly level with your cut line. When you have that spot traced, you can slowly advance the blade across your cut path, extending a groove that is about a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch deep. This will give you your best shot at making a clean cut moving forward. And I'll mention here that some people actually like to use a guide block to start their cut. To do this, they'll just make a square cut on a piece of wood, preferably with a miter saw, then clamp or nail that piece just a shade below their cut line. 
This block then provides a straight backer guide for your blade as you initiate your cut. It keeps your blade vertical and ensures that you travel in a very straight line. I'll admit that I don't do this much in the field because my hands just got pretty steady with a little bit of practice. But these blocks can be very helpful to newcomers. I think you just want to remove them after your first few initial passes because they can get in the way as you drive deeper. But whichever way you choose, you'll have a hard time keeping your cut clean if you make mistake number three, choosing the wrong blade. Most people know that there are specific blades for metal cutting and you won't get very far trying to cut wood with these. But when it comes down to choosing wood cutting blades, what you really want to focus on is tooth length. Multi-tool blades with long teeth, like this one, are super aggressive. They're good for rough demolition because they cut fast, but they really won't make clean cuts because they agitate so much wood and produce more friction. For slightly finer cutting, you really want to go with a smaller tooth precision blade. These blades can etch a finer line because they're thinner and not as aggressive. This is the sort of blade you want to choose for interruptive trim cuts where appearances matter because they just offer more control and a slower cutting rate overall. And when it comes to managing your cut after the first phase, try to avoid mistake number four, overdriving the cut. Even after you've scored your whole cut line, you don't want to just start plunging the blade in with full force. This will only trap it in that localized part of the wood and probably cause it to bind up from pressure. Instead of doing this, you want to sweep your cut line. Focus on making light side-to-side -side passes all the way across your cut, taking about a sixteenth or eighth of an inch depth on each pass. And lean the saw away from your cut direction ever so slightly. This will allow the frontal teeth to engage the wood as they approach it. Using the saw in these shallow sweeps avoids binding the blade from too much pressure. It also pushes sawdust out of the kerf as you cut, which relieves friction and heat buildup. By sweeping like this in passes, you'll eventually punch lightly through the back of the material. This will let you angle the blade a bit more and drive a sideways cut through the remaining layer of stock. Getting to this point though can still take a bit more work and it'll be much harder if you make mistake number five, cutting on low speeds. Multi-tools used to be a one switch corded tool and this problem wasn't as much of an issue then. But with the rise of really good cordless tools, we've also seen more variable speed triggers and I think this has caused a problem because multi-tools really cut wood best on high speeds. Keeping a cut running smooth is all about keeping the teeth moving, clearing waste, and not binding up. If multi-tools are running slow, the individual blade teeth will essentially grab wood and hold on. The tool will either kick or bind, or it will tear wood pulp instead of slicing it. For this reason, if I'm using a variable trigger, I like to pin mine at max speed. They have a button for this. This keeps it fully revved and moving fast. Now you don't have to think about holding the trigger, and you're getting max cutting speed the whole time. And finally, mistake number six is kind of a universal fail, using dull blades. Yes, you could say this applies to all power saws, and you'd be right. But for my money, it applies most to multi-tool blades. Circular saws and jigsaws can basically muscle their way through dull blade cuts. But when anybody starts experimenting with multi-tools, they quickly discover that these blades dull out fast, and they become almost useless when they do. The small teeth get filed down, usually in a dip pattern at the center of the blade. Now the multi-tool is like a flat scraper, just gnawing away at wood. It won't work. You've really got to keep an eye on your blade teeth and preferably just change out blades when they start to wear down. For this reason, I tend to order bulk off-brand replacements because they're so much cheaper and highly abundant. Diablo, on the other hand, has put out some seriously good long usage blades and they're awesome, but they are quite pricey. I won't say how much because these prices just change weekly, but they are considerably more than generic brands. All the same, keep your blades sharp. The tool really can't do anything without all these tiny little points at the tip. And I'll say now, if you're looking for perfectly tight square cuts, this really is not the tool for it. Because it vibrates and it's freehand guided, cut interiors almost always come out a little ragged or even rounded, whether you use a guide block or not. But they're still immensely helpful because they'll let you make precision plunge cuts on almost any wooden surface. No other tool does this, and if you keep your entry line fairly clean, the cut will come out looking clean. I also think that you can actually back bevel your cuts a tiny bit to make them sharper. I exaggerated here, but you can see the effect. Or you can leave your cuts a little ragged and fill into the gaps with wood filler and sand to a fine finish. Both are options. At any rate, I hope all that's helpful. Again, I'll link multi-tools, blades, and attachments down below. And I'll also link my books. So if you got kids or grandkids, consider grabbing a couple. It's a great way to support the channel.
As always, thanks for watching, and I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting that bell button to turn on notifications. That way you'll know the moment we post something. I'm Ethan James with The Honest Carpenter. I'll see you next time.